Lance. <laughs> lines in her. Yes. Yeah, she's got more instinct to yes. her. Yes. Yes. Oh, no. Yeah. You tell him. Wow. See, that's amazing. Girl, hmm? Oh. Sit, sit, sit. Yes, Opa, that's my puppy. So cool. <laughs> this one is my favorite. Okay, my name is Les Flores. I'm a retired police officer, canine officer, detective, and uh, also a dog trainer. There are certain things you have to do to get to the high level. Number one, 
You gotta show the dog what you want. You gotta teach the dog how you want it done, and then you train the dog. But before you get there, I have to train the person and to how to handle a dog like that. So I go through a process of teaching the person how to walk with a dog like that. Sometimes I haven't handled my dog. So they can say, this is how you need to walk. This is what you need to do. To get to the points that you need to do, to get that little extra half a point that the judge may take in a, in a competition, you need to stand this way. You need to start walking this way. You need to have confidence as you walk. All these people that do have the confidence that they think they can do this work, uh, you know, they, they say, well, this is easy to do because I see it. I see YouTube videos. And I said, yeah, okay, you see the YouTube videos, but you don't know what happened prior to having that particular exercise be completed in, in, in perfection. You know, so this is the things that you need to do. Okay, you need to stand correctly. Watch your shoulder, watch your head. How's your hand? What are you doing? If you're doing one of those things, these judges are, are, are they watch every little thing. And your performance could be very nice, but at the end you do some handler of help and then there, there goes your, your excellent performance. You know, so all those things that I do with these people, I teach them first how to be a handler. Oh, look at the dog. Look what the dog brings to the table. I see you as a handler. What do you bring to the table? Are you compatible with this dog? If you're not, then let's try to see what we can do. If let's say they get a dog and then they want to just jump in and start training, but they didn't do that one critical step that you always start off with is earning that respect and trust first. Can that throw that off? Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. You know, I... I in, in some of the dogs, um, and I can just tell you from experience that I have dogs that uh, that were trained before, and they came with uh, with okay scores, and it's been uh, after I get the dog probably three months, four months, and sometimes even six months, you know, that the dog could be really working for me. I can get the dog and I can start doing the healing and stuff like that with the dog or I can do whatever I want, but it's not a team. You see? And that's what a lot of people are lacking. They want to they wanna go so fast into the sport that they cannot, they don't spend enough time with the dog creating that, what you call a bond. You know, and the same thing in, in when I was working as a police officer in a canine unit, the dog has to have a bond with you. If you don't have that bond, you know, you just have a dog and a handler. That's it. There are people that want to do the sport because they want to be do something they want to do something with their dog. Their, their goals are not necessarily going out to a world championship or a regional championship or anything. They want a title of the dog, have fun with the dog. Those people are totally different than what you are asking right now. These people that you're asking that they, they, they buy these dogs because they think they want to do it, but they don't have the discipline to do the work, they will never go far. You know, they may look a little bit and they, they may, they may ha score okay in one regional or a trial, but that's it. You know, uh, no discipline, nah, you, you, you won't. You have to have it. Uh, it, it you're looking at a, a, a living, living uh, creature uh, that you just go there and grab and take it out and, and uh, uh, and go to a trial and that's it and then put it back out in, in the kennel now. I often see that those are the same people that always blame the dog or <laughs> the judge or somebody else at the show or do you see that? Absolutely, you see it all the time. A lot of the people that say, well, my dog did this, my dog did that. No, your, your, your training sucked. <laughs> Basically, you know, <laughs> and, and then you want and you want to get the dog to, to go there and win stuff. You may have a fantastic dog, but if you don't have the discipline and your training is lazy, you will never reach that position. And then you're always going to blame the dog. Or if you go to a trial, you're going to say, well, you know, the helper did this in, in protection or, or the judge, you know, the judge didn't like my dog. No, no, probably the judge didn't like the way you train your dog. You know, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> that's a wrap. <laughs> Do you find that sometimes when you're looking for somebody who's got older lines with very primitive genes, that that dog is, is a, a good thinker,
but sometimes a little harder to train because you got to get through that thick skull. Mm, right? We have two dogs that are from a very old uh, family in Finland, like one of the first ones. And I, I think they are very nice dogs. Of course, they do have kind of strong head, but I think in sled dog, it's a good gene. Do you like, feel that when you get a dog with a strong brain that you have to maybe earn respect first before you start doing any training? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, sure. yeah. If there's a dog with a little bit stronger hair, they might like they don't first they don't might might not listen and might not like you could say that every time you have a dog you have to build the like the respect and like a good connection before the work is like really good. What do you do to try to earn that respect before you start training? So we want to spend a lot of time with them and be with them so that they can learn from us and we can learn from them. If you really analyze how things go down, I mean, people that have a, a consistent record of being successful, it's because they, they have good dogs, they condition them properly, they present them well, and they do their homework, you know. It's a, it's a lot of work, and, and I've learned over the years, I mean, there's absolutely times where, where you know that when you won, maybe there was a dog in second that could have won, and then there's times where you think that you've been, you've been back there where you should have won, but the problem with some people is they think they should always win. You know, they don't, you know, they might have the dog that should have went third, it wins or it goes second and they're complaining because they're in second place when in reality they should have been in third place, you know, and it's because they don't take the time to really study the animals that they're, that they're working with and that they have and they really maybe don't know nearly as much as that they think they know, you know. I, I remember one of my old friends that was a, Another mentor that we used to spend a lot of time with who's now passed away, and he used to say something, and I don't know if I can get this right, but he, it was like he used to say about some people, it's like, they don't know enough to know that they don't know what they think they should know, you know? And there's just like a lot of truth to that. So, I mean, there's like fantastic old dog books, you know, and videotapes, and, and just there, there's people around that really, really know dogs, and you've got to track those people down and, and, you know, spend time with them and try to, for the young people, you know, to, to try to go work for some of these professional handlers, and, and don't worry about trying to get in the ring with the dogs, just worry about working in the background and hanging around with them, and don't act like every time you turn around you need to get paid for something because in reality a lot of times I mean you could almost be paying them just to be able to hang around with them because I mean it, it costs money to go to school you know and it uh, I always say like a lot of the lessons that you learn as you go through this business and, you know if you you always keep an open mind and realize that you know no matter how long you do this I mean, you keep an open mind. I mean, you know, the janitor at the building may come up and say something to you that you can pick something up off and it makes you think, you know? That's when you start to realize, or not when you start to realize, but when you start to think that you've got a handle on all this stuff and you know everything, I mean, that's where you start realizing that, you know, you, you maybe don't. My name is Dara Hunt and I am a professional dog trainer specializing in dogs that are working lines in the sport of IPO or Schutzen. We use food in the beginning because we can take things down and make it clear that the dogs don't get quite so excited but it's still motivating enough that they want to work with us. So I get down on his level and he knows that first thing I'm going to do is show him that I have food and I'm just going to give him a piece. It's a freebie dude. <laughs> okay, and then I'm going to get him perpendicular to me. No, come on, don't be lazy. Come on. So that it's easier for me to work, and I'm going to tell him to sit, sits, and I have him pushing on the food. My hand goes up over his head, which makes his head go back and his butt go down. He has no choice but to sit. So I've just taught him that the word sit means to put your butt on the ground. And he's pushing for the food, but he's not getting anything. So then I'm going to tell him to platz, platz. 
Yes, plots, good plots. And I'm gonna teach him that food comes from the ground, not from my hand, because I don't want him popping up. As soon as I stand up, if he's been fed from my hand, if I stand up, he's gonna stand up too, and I don't want that, plots. Would it be safe to assume that the first thing is you're gonna to try to earn the respect of that dog before you really start serious training? Yes. I'm going to find a common commonality, a place where we can respect each other and want to work with each other. So uh, I, ha I have to find something of value to the dog. They're, they're, every dog has a key and it's my responsibility as the trainer to figure out what the key is to that particular dog. And it may not be the same from one dog to another. Uh, I've, I've had dogs that I've worked with that uh, would only work for, for little pieces of red licorice. Um, I've had dogs that uh, wouldn't work for anything except gorgonzola cheese, which was really nasty and stinky, but it worked. Uh, it was, you know, I, I, I'm constantly, uh, especially when I'm working with a, a new dog or a new puppy, I'll come out with, you know, five or six different kinds of bait. I, 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 Costco is my friend. I get all of my bait at Costco. <laughs> I figure if the dog doesn't like it, I'm going to eat really well for a week. <laughs> and, and not only what makes the dog want to work for me, but what really makes the dog want to work for me. And then when I find that, that's my key and that's what I use. And then I can start to, to communicate and build vocabulary with the dog. But it's my job as the trainer to find the key for that particular dog. If you're going to be the leader between you and your dog, then you have to present yourself as the leader. And even if you don't know what you're doing, you have to act like you know what you're doing. Um, and you have to believe it. So if you make a mistake, you can't sit there and dwell on it and go, oh, I made a mistake. Oh because the dog's going to go, uh, mom's not in control and nobody else is in control, so I'm going to be in control. And that never works out well. Um, so I, I tell my students, you know, look, if you make a mistake, err with confidence. Act like you meant to make that mistake. It's more important that you present yourself as the leader and that you're in control of the situation. And if you, if you mess it up, so what? So what? I guarantee you the dog has already forgotten about the fact that you messed it up, so don't dwell on it reset yourself, do it again, and do it right. And if you still don't do it right, do it again. The more that you do it, the more, the better you're going to get at it. It's a matter of repetition, and the repetition brings confidence. Don't dwell on the bad stuff. Don't pay attention to the stuff that you messed up. Go with the stuff that you did right. It commands the sit, the down, the come, the stay, all of those things. It, that it's those things are secondary in importance. What's important is that you are controlling the situation. You are giving the dog, a, a, you are defining a word for a dog that this word means do this action and the dog is willingly following you to do those things. Um, that At that moment that the dog uh, submits and does those things, he's saying, okay, you are the pack leader. I'm listening to you. I'm giving you control. What else do you want me to do? And then you have communication. From me as the, the trainer and the owner and the handler, uh, it's, it's my obligation to do the research to figure out what bloodlines, what, what kennels, what dogs. It really at a core, it all comes down to the specific dog. You can look at bloodlines all day long. You can look at, at, at trial scores all day long. Um, it really comes down to the dog itself. Uh -huh.